As I've mentioned before, I can't give physics the finger. I have to use all 10 because I am a physicist. And I'm a newbie to TED Talks, so I still just can't appreciate your enthusiasm. But this is physics, so I give you permission not to be quite as enthusiastic about physics as you have been about some of the other speakers. <laughs> However, I can't give you permission not to pay attention to what you really need to know. The problem, as I see it, is radiological ignorance leads to fear, leads to bad decisions. And I'm hoping when we're done today, there'll be a little less fear. The approach I'm going to use in this talk is to talk about perceptions. And I'll actually put them in quotes so you can tell that this is a perception that I think people have. We'll talk about them, and hopefully some knowledge transfer will occur. Radiation is important to our past and our future right here in the Tri-Cities. And I'll try to point that out as we go on. When I talk to college science classes, I often start out with a plate of cookies and I pass it around, mumbling something about, we'll do an experiment to see if cookies are good for the learning experience. Being good high school students, the cookies disappear very quickly. So imagine I'm passing around this plate of cookies and that you're eating one. Because when I get done, I get out my Geiger counter and I show the students that have just eaten the cookies, you've just imagined eating a cookie, that the plate is radioactive. This is fiesta wear. There's uranium in the glaze. Now, for the students that have just eaten the cookies, and hopefully for you, I have your attention. <laughs> but there's more to it than that. I want to show a couple of different things, and one is the most simple, but it's an incredibly important concept. This is the radioactive material. The radiation comes out here and hits my detector at a distance. The radioactive material and the radiation all around it. We'll notice as we get closer to the radioactive material, the intensity of the radiation hitting my detector goes up. We get farther away, the intensity goes down. That's a pretty important concept. How much time you spend close to the radiation source determines what your radiation dose is going to be. We'll talk about that in just a minute. There's another thought here that's good for us at Hanford. In this piece of fiesta wear, the uranium glaze, which is what gives it its orange color, is locked up in the glaze. It doesn't come out. Only the radiation escapes from here. That's what we're going to do with the waste here at Hanford. We're going to glassify it with compounds not too unlike what's in this plate to be able to now take this and put this somewhere where it won't hurt anybody or bother anybody. The last thing I need to talk about is you'll notice that the clicking is not totally uniform. It's sporadic or statistical in nature. That's one of the aspects about radiation and radioactive material, as we start off with kind of a black eye, we have to start talking about statistics. So we talk about means and standard deviations. Well, if you have to do math, you don't want to do math with mean numbers. You want to have nice numbers. <laughs> and believe it or not, you have to study the standard normal deviate. Well, does that mean they're abnormal or substandard deviates? Is it safe for our children to be around them? Uh, mathematicians talk about errors in numbers. Well, I as a taxpayer say, what's wrong with your number? If there's an error in it, fix it. That's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about the uncertainty. Um, the next little demonstration I'd like to do for you involves a particular source. It's polonium-210, and I spell it for you because this sounds a lot like plutonium, which is a different isotope. Polonium-210 is actually one of the progeny of Uranium, uranium changes 14 times as it goes from uranium to lead. One of those is polonium, and polonium is a little bit unique, and it's one of the few isotopes that's totally an alpha emitter. I have some polonium in this little plastic disc, and when I move closer, you can see that it's quite intense right down next to the source. When I back up a little bit, a few inches of air is enough to stop all of the radiation. Similarly, if I have this source down here, one sheet of paper stops virtually all of the alpha particles. Um, I mentioned this 
particular isotope as another reason because it illustrates some interesting things. The amount of radioactive material makes a difference. And in this particular case, polonium-210 is made in vast quantities by the Russians in their nuclear reactors for warships. They use heavy metals as a coolant and they make just huge quantities of polonium-210. It has a 138-day half-life, it only emits alpha particles, so as a waste, it's not too bad. As a byproduct, it's an incredibly efficient poison. And in 2006, a guy named Alexander Litvinenko, who used to work in the Russian security services, criticized Mr. Putin and then left the country quickly, escaping to London, he thought. It turns out the Russians sent a couple of guys and they put some polonium-210 in his tea. And in fact, if you can see there on the slide, there's a blue dot. And on that blue dot is a little crystal, a salt crystal. That's about the amount of polonium-210 they put in his teacup. And two weeks later, he was dead from a rather horrible and gruesome uh, case of radiation sickness. This is one of the more radioactive substances known to man. If we had uranium, with that much radioactivity, it would have to be a billion times bigger. That's a thousand times a thousand times a thousand. So the cube of uranium would be bigger than the teacup if we were using that much radioactivity as uranium. But as polonium, it's less. Um, radiation is a new problem invented by scientists. It's something that I run into. Well, no, it isn't. Radioactive material is everywhere. It's been there since the start of the solar system. Rocks, water, air, living systems, wood, all are about a part per million uranium. Uh, talking about uranium, we talk about U-238 and U-235. U-238 has 92 protons and therefore 92 electrons, and it has 146 neutrons, the difference between 238 and 92. U-235 is another isotope that's important. It's important to the Tri-Cities. I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, and I want you to remember chemistry. Carbon has six protons and therefore six electrons, and every atom of carbon behaves like it does, hooks together, makes nice living molecules, and we have the body. Nitrogen acts like nitrogen and makes things like fertilizers and explosives. It has seven protons and seven electrons. Oxygen has eight protons, eight electrons, and makes things like water and rust and such like that. Everything on Earth is about one part per million uranium. To give you an idea of that, I looked at two pounds of rocks, and then I looked at essentially a thousand tons of water. So if you look and see the red outline up here, you can see a cube 100 feet long, 33 feet wide, and 10 feet tall. That's about a thousand tons of water. So this much uranium, is diluted in every thousand tons of water in the Columbia River. So in some respects, it's a lot. You say, well, gee, that's diluted quite a bit. Yeah, but even after we dilute the two pounds, there's still a billion, billion atoms in every quart of the water. U-238 is radioactive. It goes through 14 changes. It goes from U-238 to lead. One of them is this polonium-210. Uh, so radiation isn't new, it's naturally been around for a long time, it wasn't invented by scientists, and as we'll discuss later, it's not always a problem. Nuclear reactors and nuclear weapons. Scientists didn't invent radiation, but they did invent nuclear reactors and nuclear weapons. Why? Well, World War II was the driver. We were concerned as a country that the Germans were going to manufacture nuclear weapons. We had to have them too. It turns out the war in Europe ended before we could use the nuclear weapons that we'd made. So it was decided to use them in Japan to end the war there. That's a very political decision. It's uh, lots of different sides that can be argued effectively. I'm not going to try to do that in this talk. Um, I would mention a couple things you need to know in there again. Pardon me for turning around. But U-238 is what 99.3% of your, all uranium is. Only 0.7% is U-235. And that's important because it's fissile. One neutron can split one atom, giving off a couple of other atoms and a couple of neutrons. Those two neutrons can now split two atoms more, so we have four neutrons and eight neutrons, 16 neutrons, 
Every time giving off a little bit of energy, pretty soon we have a big deal. Plutonium-239 is also fissile. It can do that uranium chain reaction. U-238 cannot. To make a reactor fuel, it's got to be enriched to about 4%. To make a weapon, it has to be enriched to 90%. So reactor fuel cannot really be used to make a bomb. You have to do a lot of work to take reactor fuel and convert it into a nuclear weapon. Also, plutonium is different than uranium chemically, so we could separate it. And that's why the Manhattan Project here at Hanford was so important. In Oak Ridge, they managed to figure out how to take uranium and enrich the U-235. Here at Hanford, we took some of their enriched uranium, the rich to 4%, and used it to make plutonium, which we were able to chemically separate. Okay, reactors and reprocessing. Reactors normally take water, goes through the reactor, makes hot water, we put it into a steam turbine, we make electricity. That's what we do with it today. Back during World War II, the idea was to put uranium 238 and 235 into the reactor, and out we came with a little bit less uranium 238. We converted some of the molecules to plutonium 239, and some of the U-235 we'd split into waste. We reprocessed, that's an engineering word for processing, <laughs> uh, into fresh fuel product, is actually what they called it, one of the euphemisms they had during the war, and waste products. It turns out there was a lot more waste than there was plutonium-239. To give you an example, we have the 177 underground storage tanks that are full, more or less, with all the waste we've ever produced here. If we took all the plutonium that we'd made here at Hanford, it would just about fill the back of my Subaru. But don't try this experiment at home. <laughs> One is, it still weighs 50 tons, so my poor Subaru would not be going anywhere. And secondly, after you'd loaded in a couple pounds or so, it would go boom. That's why you make plutonium-239 in the first place. <laughs> Future of the Tri-Cities. We need to clean up the waste that's left over from decades of producing plutonium for nuclear weapons. Um, and we need to do it in a way that makes our neighbors happy about it. Possible economic benefits, we'll be able to participate in the development of small modular reactors to one extent or another, and we may be able to develop new ways of using radiation in medicine. Deadly radiation. It's so often used, you'd think deadly was radiation's first name. <laughs> when we look at the media, the entertainment, and the popular culture, deadly and radiation are just linked together. Now, true, when humans are exposed to large amounts of radiation, such as the use of a nuclear weapon or a cup full of the plutonium-210, the results are deadly and kind of gruesome. However, when humans are exposed to very small amounts of radiation, the results are very ambiguous. It is very hard, if not impossible, to see cancer effects in DOE workers, in nuclear power plant workers, in hospital workers, and others all around the world. You can't see the effects of radiation exposure. They're there, but they're small. As part of our culture, in comic books and B-movies, we have all kinds of myths about radiation exposure, and Ted won't let me put the pictures in here, so we'll do this Jeopardy style. Okay, <laughs> who is Bruce Banner, and does he become the Incredible Hulk? Did Godzilla invade Tokyo? Uh, does Peter Parker become Spider-Man when he chooses to put on the costume? You know the answers to all of those. Units. You'll hear about half-life. You'll hear about activity in Curies or Becquerels. You can hear all kinds of radiological units. There's only one you really need to know. And that's the dose. The dose is the energy absorbed by something, say a human organ in the human body, divided by the mass of that organ. The sievert is the international unit of dose, and it's weighted for radiation type. The alpha particles do more damage than the electrons that just bounce around from gamma rays. And organs, like the lungs, are more susceptible than some of the harder bones. Rather than giving you a definition and then give you an example of radiation dose, I'll just skip to the example. I pass this out because there's enough information in there for a one-hour talk, much less an 18-minute talk, on exposure to ubiquitous background and medical radiation. The top half is the background radiation. This is the radiation that comes from rocks, soils, the sun, outer space. 
Some of that is uranium, and some of that uranium turns into radon, which escapes from the walls or the wood or whatever, the rocks around your house, attaches to a dust particle and we breathe it in, and it's a pretty large contributor to radiation dose. Industrial uses are down here in this little tiny green sliver, and nuclear power is almost insignificant sliver of that green sliver. The rest of this is medical radiation exposure, CT uh, exams have given rise to an awful lot of exposure in the last 20 years. Health effects of humans, like I say, finding health effects of low doses in human populations is between difficult and impossible. So we scale from the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to set regulations for acceptable levels of exposure to rad workers and to people in the general public. Radiation has never done anybody any good. The practice of medicine, you know, if surgeons had to go in with a knife and figure out what they figured out with an x-ray, medical would be a lot different than what it is today. DNA was invented, uh, discovered with x-ray crystallography, thus unlocking all of what we know about DNA. And in my opinion, production of electric power has to depend, uh, using reliable electric power in the future is going to depend on using nuclear energy. I don't know much about radiation, I don't trust anyone who does. We invented radiation protection here at Hanford. Nobody had ever used that much stuff and we did a good job. At the breaks, I can tell you more about that. There were mistakes that the Russians made. Uh, their workers had radiation pneumonitis. Uh, they exploded a high-level waste tank. They put high-level waste in a little river about the size of the Yakima near one of their sites. And we had some mistakes too. Shoe x-ray machines and TB screening are an example of some of those. Radiation is packets of energy. Radioactive material is the material that produces the radiation. They're different. And lastly is Mr. Adam. This is me earlier in my career. Mr. Adam is a phantom, which is what you use when you don't want to use a human to do radiation experiments. I'll tell you more about him at the break. Thank you.